Now, it's very important that we understand what repentance is. Repentance is not an emotion. I've seen many times preachers will seek to work people up into an emotional attitude and then call them to faith in Christ. And very, very often that leads to a letdown because they, the emotion runs out and they're left with nothing. So bear in mind, repentance as defined in the Bible is not an emotion. It is a decision. It doesn't spring from the emotions. It springs from the will. If we can reach people's will and turn their will, we will see permanent conversions. Many of the so-called conversions in the church today are impermanent because they have never really changed the will of the person. They've had an emotional experience, they've got excited, maybe they've felt wonderful for a few weeks or months or even years, but in the end they don't have what it takes to go through because their will has not been touched. Now, you know there are two main languages of the Bible, Greek of the New Testament and Hebrew of the Old. And each of those languages has a specific word for repent. But only if we put the two languages together do we get the full meaning of repentance. The Greek word in secular language is always translated to change your mind, to change the way you think. So, first of all, repentance is changing your mind about the way you've been living. I've been living to please myself, to do my own thing. From now on, I'm going to live to please Jesus, my Savior. It's a decision. As I've said before, it is not an emotion. You can repent without any obvious emotion. But you cannot repent without a change of your will. And then the Hebrew word, and this is so typical of the Jewish people because they're a very down-to-earth people. They want to know, well, what does it work out at? And the Hebrew word for repent means literally to turn around. You've been facing one way, the wrong way, with your back to God. You turn 180 degrees, face toward God and say, God, here I am. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. So you put the two together and you have a complete picture of repentance. And faith comes only after repentance. The whole message of the Bible is in this order, repent and believe. There are lots of people, and some of them are here this morning, who are struggling for faith. The truth is, you're not struggling for faith. You've never met the condition of repentance. You see, it's the first of the six foundation doctrines. And if you don't have that foundation stone in place, your building will always be wobbly. I have counseled over the years hundreds of people, hundreds of Christians, who've come with their personal problems. And after a, a lot of experience, I came to this conclusion. At least 50% of the problems of professing Christians or real Christians are due to one fact they have never truly repented. They have never really changed their mind. They've never really made a decision. They've never really surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus in their lives. They're still thinking about decisions from this point of view. Now, if I do this, what will it do for me? And if I do that, what will it do for me? When you've repented, that's not the way you think. You think, if I do this, will it glorify Jesus? If I do that, will it glorify Jesus? And so we have multitudes of people, I think especially young people, but not only young people, who are double-minded. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He doesn't have a solid foundation. He doesn't, he can't produce a stable building. So I invite you just where you are right now, quietly to reflect for a few moments and ask yourself, have I ever really, truly repented? Or am I still double-minded? On Monday, my aim is to please Jesus. On Tuesday, my aim is to please myself. 
You see, you've got the worst of both worlds, actually. You'd be better off just living in the world, living for yourself. Because you're a double-minded person, you're a split personality. Now we have to go on with the nature of repentance. There is one parable that Jesus told, which is the most vivid and perfect illustration of true repentance. It's the parable of what we call the prodigal son. Though somebody else has said it should be called the caring father. You remember the story in Luke 15, most of you know it. The second son of a wealthy family decided to get all his inheritance from his father right now and went off to a distant, distant country and lived it up. He did, he, spent, he did all sorts of sinful things and then when he'd spent his whole inheritance a famine came and the only job he could get was feeding pigs and you have to remember he was Jewish so for him to feed pigs was just as low as he could come without any slight on pig farmers we're not saying anything against them but it just so happens that for the Jewish people the pig is right outside and so here he is in rags feeding the pigs hungry wishing it he could fill his stomach with the husks that the pigs are eating and then this is what happens verse 17 of Luke 15 when he came to himself he said oh, that's the point you have to come to you have to come to yourself what I call the moment of truth you have to see yourself as you really are you have to see yourself as God sees you. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am not longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hard servants. Now you see the two elements, because it goes on to say, and he arose and came to his father. He made a decision and he turned around. That's repentance. Making a decision and carrying your decision out. Going back to the father whom you have offended, to the God who loves you, saying, I've made a mess of my life. I can't run my own life. I need you. Will you take me back? The wonderful thing is he planned to say to the father, make me as one of your hard servants. But when he started out, his father was watching for him. I think this is so beautiful. That's how God is. When we begin to turn, he's watching for us and waiting for us. And the father saw him a long way off and ran to meet him. That's how God is. That's how he meets us. And he kissed him. And he never let him say those last words. Make me as one of your hired servants. He said, bring out the best robe. Put a ring on his finger. Sandals on his feet. And kill the fatted calf. That's the result of true repentance. It's worth repenting to be welcomed like that by God. That's the picture. Just think about it for a moment yourself. He came to himself. He said, I've made a mess of my life. I've wasted everything my father gave me. But I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to go back to my father and say, I'm sorry. And he turned and went. Think about that. That is true repentance. Repentance in action. Now there can be a false repentance, which we in English today call remorse. Judas experienced that, described in Matthew 27. Verse 3 and following. Then Judas, the betrayer of Jesus, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, 
I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Judas had remorse, but he never changed. In fact, I believe he passed the point where he could change. And to me, this is a solemn thought. People can, in this life, pass the point where it's possible for them to change. I think the most significant moment in any human life is the moment when God begins to deal with you about repenting. And if you shrug your shoulders and say, well, I'm not interested, maybe later, there's no guarantee that God will ever deal with you again. The most, the most critical moment in any human life is the moment when God says, repent. I'm willing to take you back. I love you. I want you. I've, I've considered what I've seen in people's lives and in the Bible. And I've come to the conclusion that there's one thing that makes God really angry. And it is despising his grace. He freely offers us his grace. But if we despise it, he turns in anger.